Good morning, everyone, and thank you for joining us for our uh, July 15th STEM career talk in our series of talks this summer that are introducing us to a number of fields, research areas, and STEM professionals who are working at Berkeley Lab, Lawrence Berkeley National Laboratory, as well as industries around the nation who are interested in STEM and making sure that we are bringing science solutions to the world. My name is Faith Dukes. I'm director of our K-12 STEM education and outreach programs here at Lawrence Berkeley National Laboratory, one of 17 Department of Energy National Laboratories in California. And I would like to also now introduce my co-host for this session, Myra. Myra is currently an intern in our Experiences and Research program, and along with last week's host, Elvira, she's helped produce recent content on our social media pages. Next week, our final STEM career talk series of the summer will be planned and hosted by El Elvira and Myra as a team. Myra, welcome to the virtual stage, and thanks for being my co-host today. Thanks so much for the introduction, Faith. I'm super happy to be co-hosting today. So before we start, I'd actually like to introduce last week's, um, one of last week's panelists, um, Dr. Johanna nelson Wecker. She's going to introduce us to today's energy field trip about grid resilience. So thank you so much for joining us again, Johanna. Um, before we start the discussion, could you give us a little introduction to what exactly grid resilience is and why it's important? Johanna, I'm gonna stop you for a second. We can't hear you just quite. Can you hear me now? Yes, yes. Okay, great. Sorry about that. Um, so grid resilience um, is about um, protecting the electricity grid. Um, and, um, and this is specific to things like large weather events. Um, and this is becoming increasingly more important as climate change makes the frequency of large um, weather events um, happen um, increasing, basically. Um, and so energy storage um, is one component as a part of, of shoring up our electricity grid and, and allowing it to be more resilient against um, the weather and, and disasters like that. All right, awesome. So like I mentioned before, today's topic on grid resilience is the second part of the energy storage field trips that the energy storage team developed. So could you give us a little, um, would you mind sharing a little bit about what audience, what the audience can expect from today's recording? Yeah, so we have a few short clips um, from the tour that we did on the Bad River Band Reservation. This is a reservation in Wisconsin, and they recently deployed two microgrids. Um, and their microgrids um, were to shore up um, and make more resilient their critical infrastructure. So two of their critical infrastructures that they identified was their, their waste management, because um, it's very important to um, be able to move waste um, out, as well as have clean water for everyone to drink. And then the second thing um, that they um, shored up was um, their clinic. Um, and so healthcare is very important, um, especially if it's a disaster. So these two things um, they identified as um, needing their own microgrids um, so that they could be more resilient against future um, weather events. And so um, these clips, you'll, you'll see first an introductory clip, um, clip about sort of um, their motivation on, on why they decided to start thinking about these microgrids. And then we're going to um, talk to our field guide host, um, Daniel Wiggins, um, and um, learn a little bit more about um, what the microgrids actually look like and, and their energy storage there. All right, thanks so much, Johanna. Um, also, we're gonna be showing the clips now. Um, you'll also be seeing a link in the chat soon where you can see the rest of the video. So now we're gonna kick it off with a very short introductory video courtesy of Entech Solutions, one of the partners, partners who worked on this microgrid project. This is a story about resilience. It's something that the Bad River Band of the Lake Superior Tribe of Chippewa Indians understands and has demonstrated time and time again. 
When torrential rains flooded the Bad River Reservation, they suffered extended power outages that crippled critical tribal facilities. They fought back from the storms, resolved to build back stronger. It was called a 500-year flood. All of this was underwater. The flooding event highlighted gaps within our emergency preparedness. And so really the tribe went back to the strategic drawing board and said, hey, you know, how can we make these buildings more resilient? You know, and how can we do it using renewable energy? Um, my name is Daniel Wiggins. I, I think Noel did a great introduction uh, prior to this. Um, I'm the air quality technician for the Bad River Tribe, uh, the Mishkazibi Natural Resource Department. Um, I also partake in uh, renewable energy projects. Uh, so I, uh, recently I was tasked uh, to be uh, the project lead in the Ishko Nagay Nawa Day uh, solar microgrid project, uh, which MuGrid Analytics and then uh, Noel also mentioned NTEC helped us uh, construct and plan and build and uh, bring to light, really. Awesome. Thank you, Daniel. How about you give us a little bit of history about the reservation and why resilience is so important to you? Well, <clears throat> a little bit of history. Uh, that, that's hard. A lot of Native American history is hard to comprise in a little one minute. But uh, we're located on the southern shores of Lake Superior, right on the northernmost point of uh, Wisconsin, as far as you can get. Um, so very beautiful. We have 12 miles of lake shore, um, and this is our homeland. This is uh, the areas that we originally hunted and gathered in. So we are, we're very, one of the fortunate tribes to be able to still live where we're at. Um, unfortunately, though, know, we also partake in regularly flooding. So um, lots of uh, projects and a lot of resiliency um, was focused on, I guess, after you know some flooding events that happened in 2016, which the video you showed earlier highlighted uh, very well. Um, could you show us around a little bit the, the solar yeah, absolutely. array and where the batteries gonna... are? Oh, flip it, perfect. And so I was standing under the rays. They work great as an umbrella too. So <laughs> unfortunately we don't got a lot of sun today. Um, but again, that's a benefit of having batteries is sometimes, you know, you, you're not gonna rely on the sun all the time. I think we already knew that just because of the night and day, but um, unfortunately we do get a lot of rain. We do get snow, snow events, uh, but primarily uh, most of our emergency events are you know, happening around this time. Again, um, we're fairly aware of a lot of the flood events that occur around here. Um, we're aware of where they occur. And so um, unfortunately we're located, unfortunately, fortunately, because we love our homeland, but some of that same, um, land you know unfortunately um floods and goes through weather events and then with climate change you know these events are just getting more and more intense i'll say gotcha and that's part of the reason you guys set up this project i hear you so um can you show us the the battery bank yeah absolutely awesome so you know this is correct me if i'm wrong but this is the microgrid this is the the solar array and, and batteries that help provide energy to the reservation's wastewater treatment plant is that right yes absolutely okay. and so um this is a, a microgrid so when the power does shut off um it is supported by the entire microgrid so we do also do have a generator that's uh, a part of the one of the components so um a little bit larger it's located within the building um but for the most part, if the outage goes, if an outage does happen, uh, the microgrid is uh, fully capable of supporting the building. Okay, it looks like Daniel has made it to the second stop on our virtual field trip, the health center microgrid and facility. So let's hop back over to him. Hi, Daniel, we see you and we see the screen. So that looks great. Can you talk to us about where you are and uh, more about the All right, so now that we've gotten an introduction to grid resilience and microgrids, I'd like to start introducing you all to our panelists for today. So we have several researchers who specialize in energy storage research that you'll be able to hear from. So first, I'd like to introduce Amy Simpkins. She's the co-founder and CEO at MooGrid Analytics. She solves wicked problems at the intersection of energy technology and economics using math and modeling. 
MooGrid provides bankable techno-economic analysis, optimized control and project development of renewable energy, energy storage and microgrids to maximize economic return, increase energy resilience and promote energy equity in the US and around the world. Next, I'd like to introduce Dr. Douglas Black, who is the Grid Integration Group Leader at Lawrence Berkeley National Laboratory. Doug's research focuses on microgrid and vehicle to grid integration demonstration projects. His work also focuses on optimizing control of vehicle to grid implementations while maximizing vehicle and grid function and minimizing overall charging costs for individual and fleet owners of electric vehicles. So thank you for joining us today. And I'd like to invite Amy to share her screen first and then Doug um, will follow. Thank you for that introduction, Myra. And um, it's a pleasure to be here with all of you today. Um, I am, if you noticed uh, in the little clip there, um, Dan Wiggins mentioned MuGrid Analytics. We were on the team with the Bad River Tribe to implement those microgrids. So we can talk about that a little bit. Um, but uh, MuGrid Analytics is uh, based out of Denver, Colorado, although we work across the US and internationally as well. I am the CEO at MuGrid Analytics and I'm also an entrepreneur, which means that I co-founded the business um, with my business partner and run the business, which um, is a lot all at once. Uh, but let me tell you a little bit about my background so we can go to the next slide, please. Um, in my early years, I was definitely that kid who wanted to be an astronaut, and that's all I ever wanted to do forever and ever. <laughs> um, I grew up in southeastern Michigan, uh, just outside the Detroit metro area or on the edge of the Detroit metro area, and every aerospace engineer that I knew uh, worked on cars uh, because many of the engineers in the southwestern Michigan, sorry, southeastern Michigan area are, are in the automotive industry there. And, um, you know, we're designing uh, the aerodynamics of cars and airbags for cars and all sorts of different, different things. But it's not what I wanted to do. Um, I fell in love with the idea of exploring the universe. And I definitely, in my high school years, was really into science, um, took as much science as possible, got really curious about um, doing science extracurriculars, but that's not all that I did. Um, I was also extremely into music. Um, I was a choir nerd and did all of the theater. So just want to take away that like, even if you're not all science all the time, um, scientists like music and theater too, and the arts. So um, stick with those things and do what you love uh, because it's a whole person uh, that has so much to offer to the world. Um, next slide, please. We'll talk a little bit about my path of how I got to where I, I am today. So indeed, I, I had a plan to become an astronaut and I executed the plan. So um, I studied aeronautics and astronautics which is just the way some universities describe the discipline of aerospace engineering. I got my bachelor's degree from the Massachusetts Institute of Technology in Cambridge, Massachusetts. And then I went on, on to receive a master's degree from University of Southern California in Los Angeles. From there, I worked for 10 years for Lockheed Martin, which is a very large corporation. It has many, many divisions. They work on many types of technology. Um, and have locations across the United States. Um, I work for Space Systems Company located in Denver, Colorado, which is how I ended up moving to Colorado initially. And there I worked on a variety of subjects. One of the things that's beautiful about working for a large corporation is that you get to move around and you get to work on different projects. You get to work for different bosses, different customers, um, different phases of the project life cycle. And so I worked first in performance modeling for Earth observing satellites. So satellites in low Earth orbit, taking pictures of Earth and predicting how their performance would be affected by their altitude and orbital inclination. Then I moved on into the manned spaceflight world. And if you've been following it all, you'll know about the Orion spacecraft. Um, I worked on Orion in the very early stages of design and development, but taking a look at the system architecture, how all of the subsystems are going to come together into one holistic system so that the whole is greater than the sum of the parts. And I finished up my time at Lockheed in spacecraft operations, 
um, for interplanetary exploration. And the picture right there is the last spacecraft I flew, which is Juno, which is still out there flying around Jupiter and taking beautiful pictures. I saw one go by on social media just yesterday of a new picture that came down from Juno, and I'm so proud of that sp spacecraft. But what's interesting about your career path is that even if you are working in a subject area that you love, that you thought you were going to love forever, you are still human and you may still get curious and want to try something different. And I did. I wanted to try something not only in a different subject area and see how I could spread my wings, but also move away from the large corporate environment where I was working in large teams. And I got inspired by the idea that an individual can make more of an impact. And the way that I saw to do that was to be an entrepreneur, to start my own thing. And my eventual business partner was working for a sister lab to Berkeley Labs, the National Renewable Energy Lab, which is located in Denver, Colorado, and works on some of similar topics that Berkeley Lab does. And together we decided, hey, like, I think we have an idea. I think we can offer value to the community and contribute to the future of renewable energy and energy storage. So we started MuGrid Analytics. Next slide, please. So the mu in our title is for micro. So mu is the Greek letter. You'll see it there in our logo. And as you move forward in math and science and engineering classes, you'll know that the Greek letter mu is the, is the symbol we use in engineering and science for the prefix micro. So when I say mu grid, I really mean microgrid. And we look at microgrids, which are of course collections of hybrid energy generation, storage, and control hardware. So energy generation can either be renewables or fuel-based generation, which could, and fuel-based generation itself could be either traditional fossil fuels, or it could be renewable fuels like biofuels, biogas. Um, and so then we have the energy storage piece that can help us get the renewable generation and the fuel-based firm generation to work together. And what ties it all together is the controls. So MuGrid does a, a big amount of work on both the upfront modeling during design phase and also those controls during the operational phase that tie it all together. So up here, I don't intend for you to read them, but there's a couple of pieces of analysis we've done. On the left-hand side is an analysis of resilience. We, we try to analyze and model how much backup power in duration with what confidence can you expect out of a microgrid if the grid goes down. And on the right-hand side, this shows a grid connected case where the microgrid is operating and the site has the opportunity to purchase its energy from the grid. And that's an economic decision. Is it a better deal for the site to use their own on-site energy or or to purchase from the grid. And so that's what that graph is showing. Um, as I mentioned at the beginning, I had the great pleasure of working on the team at Bad River. And so um, that's actually a picture of me next to the battery unit that you just saw in the video at the wastewater treatment plant. I was out there for the system commissioning in May of 2021. And we just wrapped a study for Bad River because they are looking at now expanding the work they've already done on building scale microgrids into larger scale campus microgrids for the whole reservation core. That's my introduction and I'm excited to hear about Doug and the rest of the panelists. Hey, good morning. Um, uh, so I'm Doug Black, and as already mentioned, I'm the leader of the Grid Integration Group. Um, in you know, short description is we our, our group works to make the evolving smart grid meet the needs of both the operators and the consumers of the electric grid. Um, if you would like more information, you can go to gridintegration.lpl.gov. Next slide. 
So funny that Amy and I are both from the Detroit area. I was born and raised there. Um, and that led to my love of cars, as Amy alluded to, too. That's a, a huge auto industry there. Uh, as a kid, I um, also loved anything that that moved and taking things apart and putting them back together uh i would take apart bikes and give them they give the frames custom paint jobs and mix and match parts and sell them uh and keep many of them to ride myself um i had no idea what i'm doing now even existed uh when i was a kid the president was uh or one of the presidents was Jimmy Carter. He put uh, solar panels on the roof of the White House and uh, it was thought to be um, very unique and a bit crazy, uh, but very forward thinking. Uh, and then Ronald Reagan came in and ripped the solar panels off. And if, well, yeah, anyway, that was another story. So it, as far as microgrids, solar and battery and electric vehicles, none of this really even existed. So um, I, I did not know. Um, how I got here was, so I, I kind of you know, had a passion for science, engineering, um, summer jobs I had my junior and senior year in high school. And then my first two years of college, I did uh, hand drafting this was you know pre autocad uh hand drafting drawings of bulk material handling systems these conveyor belts and conveyor systems um, and i would go into these big auto plants and uh go make you know measurements and and see where one thing had to go to another and then go back and work with the engineers that were designing these systems to to draw each of the you know each each part and and specify its dimensions so that it could be built and assembled in in, in the plant so that that really led to a uh it really brought out my love for the for that kind of thing um so i loved engineering i chose uh electrical so rather than mechanical even though everything i had done up to that point was really mechanical focused because electrical engineering was the, the future and while that is true and it's it's paid off very well for me probably really should have done mechanical because i wasn't i'm not I wasn't, I wasn't as naturally inclined to to electrical um but still it's been a great uh great basis and i think to echo kind of amy's point it's uh, you're not sure where you're going to go but getting a good foundation you know you can go a lot of different places um with the right with a good foundation so to my last two years of undergrad i had internships with general motors big auto company um that led to a first job with with gm um, but not designing cars, designing locomotive electric systems because General Motors and General Electric both build locomotives. Uh, that led to moving to Chicago. Uh, I did some volunteer work there at an um, environmental organization, and I took a class at a local college in environmental engineering, and that led to my desire to, um, rather than make a more uh, fossil burning transportation uh, equipment uh, led to a desire to try and uh, help solve those problems. Next slide. So after three years of the at, at locomotive uh, electrical design, I applied and enrolled in uh, uh, Cal Berkeley's civil and environmental engineering grad school uh, for air quality engineering. Um, and and I could be doing what I'm doing now without the, well, my, my first, uh, first two to, to step back a second, um, my intention was only to go, go get a master's two years, go out and to do, you know, consulting in air quality, try and, you know, clean up all the, um, the emissions that, that cars and industry were making. Um, but I, I met a great uh, advisor and, fell in love with a, a, a cool project that combined kind of my electrical background um, with air quality engineering. And that's in that that first uh, kind of what looks like a hand-drawn little sketch there. My, my PhD thesis uh, was where was, uh, I developed a, a monitor uh, to detect ozone that was small enough to, to wear and so that a person could wear it and where ozone was measured in at only you know, half a dozen places in a in a city, um, this device you could use to measure people's actual exposure at points and compare that to how, how good do those monitors um, uh, represent 
uh, people's actual exposure. And it was the, those little circles are piezoelectric crystals that vibrate. I coated them with a coating, a chemical coating that when it reacted with ozone changed the vibration. And then you could, that could tell you the, um, uh, you could they convert that to the ozone concentration. Then uh, along my long winding road to research, my first uh, project as a postdoc at uh, Lawrence Berkeley Lab, which that was another great thing of being at Cal Berkeley, the connection to Lawrence Berkeley Lab um, made, made that uh, a nice transition. Um, and you'll see that center black and white photo was is a tower in the Tahoe forest that we built and then put all of these different particle monitoring and gas monitoring equipment uh, to measure the, the particle formation as pollution from the Bay Area blew over uh, the Tahoe forest and mixed with the emissions from the, the pine trees um, and how that, that formed aerosols. Um, Kind of my transition from postdoc to researcher at the lab came with, uh, you see in that upper right, the person holding the large weather balloon that's filled with uh, sulfur hexafluoride, which is a harmless tracer gas, although it does have a high greenhouse gas uh, potential, um, but it's harmless to people. And we would go into large transportation hubs uh, like Grand Central Terminal in New York, uh, the subway systems in Washington, D.C. and Boston and release these gases and other particle, harmless particle tracers too. Uh, put sensors all throughout the, the systems and with these releases be able to map and see how air moved through these systems. And this was all actually part of after um, uh, 9 11 in 2001, and then there were anthrax uh, releases and attacks or, or threats of those. And this is where the uh, uh, Department of Homeland Security was putting in sensing systems in all of these big uh, public places uh, to be able to de detect these releases. Then bringing things a little closer to home, this is my, you see right below that picture, my own uh, kitchen in which we're measuring emissions from gas stoves and how well kitchen fume hoods uh, remove those um, emissions. And uh, so you can see all the equipment that we had to put together and um, bring into a house, assemble it in the house, calibrate it all, and then run all these, these experiments. Um, the figure below it, this was the house we rented in Sacramento, and again, looking at um, uh, air quality, but how, how home filtration could be more energy efficient uh, and pro provide the most protection from uh, outdoor pollution events like wildfires, smoke. Um, so we had to instrument both the inside and outside of the house. Um, from that, I made really a, a leap because I, I was felt like I was kind of measuring the problems and doing some to, or either measuring the problem or finding ways to uh, filter it out or clean it up so that it didn't harm people. Um, I, I kind of felt more uh, compelled to, to try and uh, eliminate uh, the source of the pollution uh, rather than trying to remove it. So uh, electric vehicles were starting to come up, but the Nissan Leaf was, um, the first real mass produced one. Uh, we were trying to look for ways, the, the, uh, but electric vehicle in their, in their early stages and still today is a problem of their, their um, cost. They were, they were much more expensive than comparable gas uh, vehicles. So we looked, uh, we did a study where we took Nissan Leafs that were bi-directional charge capable where um, we could use the power from the battery to either be building loads right at the site or even to provide grid services, grid balancing services where um, in the, the electric grid needs to uh, balance its generation and to the amount of demand consumers have. And that can, can change rapidly and operators have big power plants that they use to uh, turn on and off really quickly to meet those, those loads. We demonstrated with uh, a fleet of electric vehicles that you could do that same thing with a, a clean resource. Um, that led to, to work in microgrids and, and as this, just as an example of how, what, a, what a 
winding road here and, and, and different skills that that I've had to uh, apply. This was kind of really the latest thing I did here was um, coordinating and managing a, a, a crane lifting a this is sort of our microgrid in a box um, with different switchgear transformers so that you could connect kind of plug and play um, building loads uh, and then generation PV generation battery storage be able to island uh, that group of buildings and generation or share it with with other nodes. Um, oh, I lost my slides. Oh, in my last slide. Uh, so in the big picture of microgrids, um, it, as, as uh, Daniel um, mentioned at the Bad River Tribe, um, uh, flooding events, natural disasters, that, that lower figure there shows it, just the billion dollar disasters. That doesn't even, there are thousands more of that were lower cost, lower impact of flooding hurricanes tornado wildfires in the west that we're very familiar with um and that th th those climate events are increasing and intensifying because of climate change because of fossil emissions um and the the the, the two ways to really uh make the grid more resilient is to either and the two ways we kind of uh, approach it with the, in our group is come up with tools that can rapidly reroute power distribution when you see in the figure when all the, when power lines are down there are still power lines up around in the area how can we move power around to still get it to as many people as possible um, and to create uh, planning tools that design systems that if certain sections go out how can you still keep power um, to everybody? Or put, um, as they did at Bad River, put generation and um, storage close to the consumer so that you, you take out that, that network or transmission um, power line problem uh, out, of the, out of the picture. And both of these approaches require innovations in grid modeling, forecasting, optimization, design, and operation. And one of the things I really um, love about this area is that it, it no matter well, if it, 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 you can apply so many different skills, interests, uh, you know, what things uh, that you like or, or want to do, you can be if you if you like computer programming and working alone and in you know indoors great there's so much data analytics computer software tools to create if you like doing more hands-on and 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 um you know physical projects uh there there it, it can it, it to mechanical design electrical design um it, it it offers so much and you know too that not only you're you're solving the, the problems that are being created by climate change and, get, and keeping as much power going but by using renewable resources you're um minimizing or, or addressing that climate change so that we have fewer of those good morning everyone Mara, you can go ahead and do the introduction for Aaron. Yeah, sorry. So Aaron Childs is a director at Stratagen Consulting. Stratagen is a mission-driven consulting company focused on enabling a clean and just energy transition. Aaron focuses on enabling scaled deployment of clean energy technologies, including distributed energy resources, energy storage, green hydrogen, and green hydrogen. Aaron's work includes the development of policy and regulation, clean energy roadmaps, and business strategies that help to build sustainable clean energy business models. Good morning, folks. Um, kind of fun to go last because I got to hear about um, everyone else's journeys. Um, definitely a lot of uh, similar pieces. So when when Amy talked about being just a, a big nerd in high school, that definitely 
Um, but, and before that, of course, definitely resonated, you know, taking a whole bunch of AP classes. I was a band nerd, Amy, not a, not a choir nerd. Um, but, but a lot of similar things, you know, really um, loved school, loved learning, um, all that stuff. Unlike Amy, I did not know what I wanted to do when I grew up. So um, I went to school. I chose my, um, I chose my college because uh, I didn't know where I wanted to go or what I wanted to do. And it was the only place that was warm. It was in Southern California. And I decided I, I, didn't, want, um, I didn't want that freezing weather uh, out on the East Coast. Um, I got my degrees in uh, mathematics and environmental economics. And I did um, what they call pure mathematics, which uh, is a polite way of saying it doesn't have a lot of real world applications. Um, you know, it was, it was stuff like I, I can prove, for example, or people can prove that you can color the map of the United States using only four colors and no two states will have the same color, right? So this is, this is the kind of um, skills that you learn in, in pure math, which is tons of fun. Um, but when you decide that you're ready to go get a job, uh, you know, most of the jobs in that were, you know, working at the NSA on, um, you know, codes and cryptography kind of stuff. Um, I picked up a degree in environmental economics because I could fit it into my schedule. So, um, you know, doing stuff that was easy, doing stuff that, that I thought was fun. I did research for three summers and it took me three summers to realize I did not like research. Um, so by the time I reached the end of my college career, I always said, okay, I spent a whole bunch of time doing research. I really don't want to do research. I'm not ready to spend four to six or more years uh, getting a PhD. Um, and so I uh, found, I kind of fell into a job at the local electrical utility. So these are the folks who um, build the poles and wires that provide power to your home. They plan out all of the resources that keep the lights on and, and keep energy running. Um, and I did a bunch of nerdy stuff for them. So I started out, um, you know, being those people that, that Doug talked about who, who sit in rooms and, and code things and, um, you know, do a whole bunch of math to help kind of plan out our energy supply. And that was the time where California was just trying to figure out renewable energy. And everyone was kind of freaking out about um, all of the solar and all of the wind resources that were going to be um, put in and, you know, will the lights stay on, all these kinds of questions. Um, did a bunch of uh, that, that planning and modeling work um, and then kind of uh, did, did a big analysis project and realized, oh, wow, um, there's a whole bunch of decisions that get made that are based on things that aren't the math and aren't the analysis. Um, and there's all this policy and politics that go into really, really big decisions. And I want to know what's going on there. I want to see that. So I started getting into um, more regulatory and policy work. So people who help to make the rules about how the grid gets planned. Um, had a lot of fun there uh, working on renewable energy um, and got a chance to join our corporate strategy team at the, at the utility. Um, and so that was, a, I think, a really interesting experience for me because I got to see how um, bu businesses make decisions, right? Um, and we had just had a new CEO and our CEO said, um, I think that our utility can be a leader in, in clean energy. And I think that our identity and the value that we provide to society can really be about deploying clean energy and helping in a clean energy transition in California. Um, and that was, that was really new and, and different in terms of, of what the company was about and what we wanted to do. So, um, you know, we started up some really big like EV charging programs, helping to roll out EV charging stations. Um, we started to look at some of the stuff that Doug was talking about in terms of like heating and, and HVAC and how do we help people, um, you know, electrify their homes so they're not using fossil fuels to heat their home. So um, that was really interesting work. And I got to the point in my career where um, I was ready for a change. Um, and I did a whole bunch of soul searching about what I wanted to be when I grew up and what I was going to do. So I, again, like Amy, unlike Amy, I did not have a, a vision for, for where I wanted to go. Um, and I realized that I really wanted to be um, working on, I think some of the big challenges that we have as a society. 
Um, and so I, I was like, do I, do you know, do I want to go work for, um, you know, companies that are helping to like vaccinate children or, you know, whatever, whatever. And I, I realized, oh, you know, uh, actually climate change is a really big issue and, and I can do that. And I, I know a lot of things that will um, help me to work on these kinds of challenges. And so I ended up at this um, clean energy consulting startup. And so what we do is um, a lot of the stuff we do is help to transition some of the research that Doug and Amy were talking about into kind of application, right? And making, finding ways to make sure that um, it's not just, you know, one Indian tribe that can uh, get a microgrid built, it's a whole bunch of people, right? Or that, um, yes, we have these clean solutions and, and cool technologies, but there's a whole bunch of rules in place that prevent people from using them or getting them. And so how do we change those in a way that enables um, a much broader set of people to be accessing these solutions. And so we do work on energy storage. And um, one of the things that led me into is actually working directly with some community groups who are saying, hey, um, we think there's chances for these clean energy solutions to be helping a lot of the direct problems that we're experiencing. We're in neighborhoods that are extremely polluted, um, have really high rates of asthma, um, you know, are, are unfairly facing a lot of the, the burdens that come with continued reliance on fossil fuels. Um, what, you know, how can the clean energy transition help us? How can we start um, addressing some of these problems? And so been, we got a chance to do some really interesting work with them about, um, you know, how, how a clean energy transition can not just be about reducing our reliance on fossil fuels and, and kind of managing climate change, but also addressing a whole other host of environmental issues that, that go along with that. And so that's been kind of really fun for me, at least, to see a lot more of the real world kind of lived experiences of people in terms of um, what clean energy means for them. Um, and the last piece, you know, that's, that's really interesting for us. Oh, thank you. This is a great slide change. Um, is talking to folks who are trying to deploy those, some of those clean energy solutions that that folks talked about. So the battery storage companies who are trying to help a lot of people get mic access to microgrids or um, people who are trying to decarbonize boats and long haul shipping, right? And helping them to think about, okay, um, you know, yes, we went into this for a climate change reason, but we have to make the money part work out so that we can keep doing this work. So we can make enough money to pay for our expenses and, and do this stuff. And so helping folks to think about, okay, um, what kinds of policies, what kinds of rules do we need to put in place so that uh, these things are scalable so that we can, you know, because the big challenge with, with climate change, you know, um, it's not just about the technologies. Obviously, new technologies are really important, but it's the scale of the challenge and of the problem that we're dealing with, because this is a, a full fundamental shift of, of our economy and how we use energy. And so helping with that scalability piece. Um, so this is, I guess, just a little snapshot of what I actually get to do on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, I think, you know, besides the kind of technology and policy pieces, I, you know, two other things I think I do want to highlight is um, a big part of my job that I actually really enjoy is getting to work with the team and build a team and, and mentor folks um, and help people discover what do I want to do? What do I want to do with my life? And, and how do I do things I'm passionate about and really excited about? Um, I also get to, um, you know, run really big projects and make sure we're, we're getting stuff done on time. And I think to Doug's point, you know, there's a whole ton of different ways to um, engage in clean energy, resilience, climate change, what have you. Um, if you say, wow, some of that like super nerdy stuff, maybe that's not what I want to do with my future. Um, there, don't worry, like there's uh, tons of things you can do. If you do love that nerdy stuff, like there's also really cool stuff for you. Uh, but just kind of giving a sense of sort of the, the spectrum of, um, you know, ways that you can engage with this type of work and, and be a part of, um, you know, these types of roles. So with that, I think I will turn things back over to Myra. Thanks everyone for those super interesting um, introductions. I saw some reactions while people were talking. Keep those coming in. Um, and if you have any questions, feel free to put them in the chat. So now we're gonna switch over to moderated questions first. Um, so I'd like to ask, 
Uh, first, how do researchers in the industry slash private companies collaborate to implement new tech discoveries and um, whatnot? So I guess we'll start with Amy because Amy has MuGrid and then we'll go to Aaron and then Doug. Great, so I'll just give kind of, can you hear me? I froze there for a second. Um, I um, Let me just give you an overview of who you have here because I think this is a real a microcosm of how we work together, right? So MuGrid is working with sites that want to implement distributed energy resources. They want to build stuff, put it in the ground. And so working on that at that level of building projects is one level. And then we have Aaron who's working at, I would say a level up from that is saying, okay, say there's a whole bunch of people who want to build some projects. How do we craft rules, regulations, standards, and just general guidelines for the industry and you know all the other beautiful things that she works on to say, how, how do we make that happen? And then you have at the researcher level, and Doug, I'm just gonna, you symbolize all of research <laughs> to say that like, you know, when you're, when you're me, when you're building a project and you're facing an actual site, you have to look at just what that site needs. And sometimes site to site, things are very unique. So at the research level, so now we're two levels above me, the researchers are able to say, okay, let's make some generalized assumptions and let's make it a more controlled environment so that we can make more general statements. Then it flows back down the other way. The research results flow down to Aaron who says, research can inform policy and then policy thankfully informs what we do at the project level, makes it easier for us to get projects in the ground. And so the original question was, how do we work together? How do we collaborate? Like, I think it's a, it's a cross flow both directions. There are many times when I'm looking at a site and I say, I wish there was a standard for how to do this. And believe me, our clients look at me and say, how long is this going to take? How much will it cost? Um, what is your process for design like? And a lot of those questions, because we're trying to innovate so much in the industry, we don't have good general answers to those. And so this flow, as we try to innovate the whole industry, the flow between the project implementation part, the policy and regulation part, and the research part are just really important. Um, we, From my personal perspective at the project level, we lean on research all the time. We're always looking for new papers coming out that we can point to and say, hey, this is, this was what was found and here's how we're going to do it differently in the future because of what was found. I guess just um, echoing Amy, I think, first of all, that is a, a, like a really helpful overlay in terms of how all these pieces come together, right? Um, we definitely are, are looking for our partners on the ground and both in, in research to help us know what to do. So I really like working with developers, like folks who are actually building stuff, because sometimes people will say like, yep, the rules are all done, like it's ready to go. Why aren't people building things? And then you talk to the people who are building stuff and they're like, there's no rules here or the rules keep me from doing the things that I want to do. Um, so it's really helpful for us to know about those things. And then on the, you know, on the more research side, we try and build, you know, tools, best practices so that policymakers can make good and smart decisions. And folks like Doug and, and other research organizations are developing those tools, developing innovative analytical approaches. Um, the grid challenges that we're facing today have, you know, fundamentally different mathematical questions or economic questions or engineering questions than we faced before. And so we need, you know, um, in, my, in, in our day to day, we don't have the time to, to go in and say, okay, I need, I need two years to think about this question in order to make policy, right? And so it's great to have folks who do have the time and the freedom to sort of think about these really big fundamental questions and say, hey, okay, we've got this, we did a whole bunch of research and learning and we can tell you that you should be looking at A, B, and C and you don't need to consider, you know, D, E, F, G, everything else, right? So um, that's really helpful. And I think, you know, something that we're continuing to see is that um, part of the challenge and the important part is to bring folks together because it's really easy for us to like put our blinders on and not talk to people or not see what everyone else is doing because we're all so busy. And so making sure that we get a chance to talk to people like Amy and like Doug, I think is really, really important um, to making this whole system work together. 
Yeah, and I'll I'll just uh, kind of emphasize the the two great points and great great answers by both of you. I really appreciate. Um, uh, in research, we're always working with industry, as Amy said. Both, like in the first stage, it's to find out what's needed, what what's the problem, what needs to be solved and be, by the people, you know, and learn that from the people who are really dealing with that problem. Um, and what can we do as researchers to help that? Then we get to the stage of, okay, we have some answers or we have some things that we think might work, but now we really need to know would they really work um, and, and go out and partner with, with um, uh, you know, with, with industry to do that. And then there's, we, we, we partner with different uh, emerging technologies that, that small vendors will have, large vendors um, will have, usually have uh, things that are further, further down the line, but we'll work together on those. Um, and it, it, it's, w w they, I guess, my, and my last point is, um, research is also a bit entrepreneurial, as has been mentioned many times. And, 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 I, I'll, each of the the PIs in my group and, and myself, you know, often feel like entrepreneurs because we are out, out there finding, you know, where is where is there a source of money? What can we get paid to to do research for here? And who can we partner with? And how can we create a strong team to solve this problem? Um, and we we often partner with industry to do that to to get our the the grants that that fuel our the, the grant funding that fuels our research. Awesome! Thank you so much for you know giving us the. <clears throat> you know, different levels of uh, this question. Um, and so I think, Aaron, you kind of pulled out a little bit of the obstacles that are facing everyone. And so I'd love if you all could answer um, just from either an infrastructure community or policy standpoint, what is the biggest obstacle to implementing a new technology or new technologies that you're developing? So kind of thinking about it from those three vehicles, infrastructure, community, or policy, if you want to just pick one and what's the biggest obstacle obstacle to implementing new technologies? Erin, I'll start with you and then go to Doug and Amy to finish. Oh, that's such a good question. Um, I don't know that I will tell you that this is the biggest obstacle, I, um, but I'll tell you one that we're working on right now, which is, um, when we talk about new technologies, a whole bunch of the stuff is like really nerdy, right? And most people don't understand it. So uh, one of the big things I'm working on right now is hydrogen. So, uh, you know, hydrogen that comes from sources that aren't fossil fuels, that comes from renewable energy. Um, folks are really looking at this as a solution for things that we don't know how to decarbonize right now. So you don't hear people talking about like zero emissions airplanes very often or zero emissions transatlantic boats, right? And so there's a big view, hey, hydrogen can help us with the stuff. We, it's a really cool pro, you know, solution. But when you talk about hydrogen, most people are like, are you talking about that thing on the Hindenburg that exploded? Like, will it explode here? You know, do we really want it? So um, the process of just educating folks about what is what is this technology? Is it safe? What does it mean for me? I've had people ask me, what does storage look like? Is it a box? You know, like what what if you, if you put it in my community, what would that look like? Right. Um, and so helping people understand that there's also people who say I'm working in the fossil fuel industry right now. What's going to happen to my job if there's no fossil fuels? Where where will I work? How will I take care of my family? Um, so talking through some of those like real human impacts associated with new technologies, I think has been a big part of uh, what we're seeing as, as some of the, the parts of the, let's call it like clean energy or climate transition that um, I think are need a little bit of uh, TLC right now. Okay, and then I'll say, I'll answer this in, in kind of from the infrastructure, but both um, from the technology perspective, I think a lot of the issue is so many of these technologies are in the early stages. It's it, it, not not solar panels, um, but hydrogen, especially uh, and, and energy storage, all energy storage. Hydrogen is, is energy storage, uh, but battery energy storage that you get this. And, and Amy can probably speak to this more, but I, I think we run into, you know, why it's not being implemented more. Both, you know, the cost hasn't quite come to the point of the tipping point of of uh, uh, 
mass implementation. Um, but this is also the sense of, well, should I jump in now? Should I be installing these things now? When what what if you know something better is going to these things are changing so constantly and there's so much going to happen? Why if I invest in this, do I you know stranded assets is the is a huge uh, you know huge term of meaning I invested in this and now there's something better out there. I can't even really use what I use because control systems went a different way. Anyway, um, the the uh, other aspect is in is in the the tools and try to to make these these bigger solutions uh, of of forecasting and operations tools, and that you have to integrate so many different players. It's a, that that's such a challenge and such a, a barrier um, that you've got regulators, you've got industry, you've got federal government, you've got state government, local governments, uh, the manufacturers, you got electric vehicle makers, utilities. All of these players are huge entities and they all have a huge role and a huge stake and they all want to go in the same direction, but they have their own, you know, they're, they're touching their own piece of the elephant in the dark room. Um, that, that, that is, is that, that, that's a real challenge to, to be able to integrate and make these solutions across that, that you know, people like Aaron are, 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 you know, they're going to figure it all out and we're going <laughs> to, we'll be, I'll be okay, but that's a real challenge. So. So um, I'll just say that there's there's a lot of discussion around how we approach why we're going to install distributed energy resources. So a massive driver for distributed energy has always been economics. And you're, you know, you're hearing Doug say, somebody's got to pay for it. Somebody sees it in, as an investment to install an asset. Why do they see it as an investment? Because there's an economic benefit that comes from it. And, and the way truly, you know, we can give a political commentary on capitalism, but it's what we got. And the beauty of capitalism is that we can use market forces to change behavior in a widespread way. So that's great, except for the fact that market forces and economics don't cover some of the other value streams from microgrids like community resilience, like energy justice and energy equity. And so those sort of more nebulous and maybe qualitative, and by qualitative, I mean, it's hard to assign a number to it. And, you know, all three of us here on this pa panel are nerds and we use math every day to do the work that we do. If you're going to do math on a thing, it has to have a number. Like, sorry, you have to figure out a way. So, you know, some of what we do is, you know, in balancing client objectives, goals, desires, is to say, how do we take those qualitative goals of justice, equity, even resilience, and, and say, okay, and here's the economics, and here's how we balance those two things. I think that's a huge challenge. Um, there is some... We, there are some ways when, where we can translate some of those other values into economic values. So we're all using the same like currency just to calculate on, but some might say there's ethical implica implement implications, ethical implications of assigning dollar values to some of that, that stuff. So I think that's um, kind of at a detail level, a, a huge challenge. Um, you know, the, the human race, you know, recognizes that we want to get away from fossil fuels, we want to save the planet, we want to increase justice and equity, but, you know, getting that into a technical model so that we ensure that the project we build does all that work, in addition to just like getting a financial payback is kind of a challenge. Awesome. So <clears throat> we're running out of a little, um, running out of time here, but I'd like to finish off with Kamai's question in the chat. Um, what was one of the most rewarding projects you guys have done and what effect did it have on the community? So if you guys could give a 30, 45 second um, summary of what it was. So I'll start with Doug and then go to Aaron and then Amy can finish it off. Sure. I have to say it was really the um, that uh, kitchen emissions work because that really had an impact on uh, quantifying the negative health effects of of having gas stoves gas appliances unvented uh co unvented cooking uh in houses and effects on on 
children, families, um, and the, the changes or the impacts on the industry to make better fume hoods. Um, what I hope it ultimately gets to is the electrification of, of cooking stoves. We don't have gas stoves in, in houses, um, but that's mine. Um, <clears throat> one of the things I've really loved getting a chance to do in my current job is, is working directly with community organizing groups and community members. And we act, had a chance to work with um, some folks in New York City who are in low income, mostly minority communities who are disproportionately burdened with air pollution um, and helping them to get a plan together and get other people to listen to that plan on how to retire all of the fossil fuel power plants in their community and talking about, sadly, as Amy said, the dollar value of those air quality um, concerns and talking about the dollar value of health and mortality impacts Right. And being able to use this to help make a case, hey, this is worthwhile. Right. This is an economic. Yes, it is good for communities, but this is also an economic decision for our society um, and helping to pull pieces together like that, I think, has been um, really fun and really rewarding. So the first project I ever did that we did a feasibility analysis and design study to size it. And then the site went and built it. <laughs> It was a, uh, a ranger station in the national forest in northeastern New Mexico, um, where they have a lot of wildfires. And actually, they've had a, they've had a wildfire recently there, um, the Cimarron uh, Forest District. And it was an outpost ranger station, but it had a communications uh, center to it so that if firefighters are out handling the wildfire, all the comms was coming through this station and this station needed to stay up in order to facilitate communications between firefighting teams. And they recognized that they could, they were on this one tiny little feeder that came out to their building. And so we did a microgrid analysis and feasibility study, including sizing what they should build. And it was not big. It was very small. And like nine months later, there was a press release and they were like, we did it. And it was just like, you did it. And we went and read the press release. And I said, you did what we said. Like it was so, it felt so impactful. I mean, do we wish we could have been involved like throughout the process? Yes. But like the fact that a site said, yeah, we want that. We think that's a good idea was very, very validating and felt very impactful. And then just a little plug at the end, um, in addition to just project work, um, as part of my networking in this industry, I've started a podcast called Power Flow to start facilitating conversations between people who work in different areas and don't necessarily get to interface. And so that's been extremely rewarding as well. It's not a project, but I still feel like it's moving industry forward by facilitating conversations. Awesome. Thank you to um, great questions. Uh, Amy, if you don't mind putting your link to your podcast in the chat box, I'm sure some people would love to check it out. Um, we also have the don't forget the secret life of energy storage.lbl.gov, which is a space where um, you can check out more of these virtual field trips and conversations. And I'd like to thank Amy Simpkins, Deck Black, and Aaron Childs for spending the Friday morning with us and sharing a bit about uh, microgrid resilience and their work in this industry and in energy storage. Um, we greatly appreciate it and look forward to next week when we'll be talking about just like this research for societal good um, hosted by Myra and Elvira um, who have been working very hard on the panel selection and uh, production of uh, next week's career panel. So with that being said, thank you all so much uh, for your time today to our panelists and to those who have been watching and reacting. Um, so have a good weekend, everybody. Thank you. Thanks, folks. Thank you.